Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much to Lauren for arranging this and inviting me over to speak, and everyone at Dysautonomia International. It's been a great conference, and it's been great to meet some faces that perhaps we don't get to meet at the usual EDS conferences. So thank you, everybody. So I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about, you know, what does it mean to you as a patient, this new criteria? What does it mean for the future of EDS? And um, you're welcome to ask any questions. I hope I'm going to um, kind of dispel some myths and calm people that are worried about this new criteria because I think there's been a lot of panic that's come with it and when actually there should be a lot of excitement and positivity. So I hope you go away feeling that after this talk. So a little bit about my background. I ran EDS UK for five years and a couple of years ago I um, thought we needed an international organization. There's kind of a bit of a ceiling to what a national organization can do. And there wasn't anybody that was there facilitating the collaboration between national support groups, charities, but more importantly, the researchers, the scientists, the clinicians, um, and the patient experts. So luckily, people at the, in the US, EDNF, were thinking the same. And in May 2016, the international organization, the Ehlers Danlos Society, was launched out of EDNF. So it's a very, very exciting time. It's very embryonic. We're, we're just starting out. We're, we're just over a year old. And we have launched with amb an ambitious mission. Um, but I feel like we are getting there slowly but surely. So that's, that's who we are. And one of the best things about the society is we facilitate the work of the newly formed International Consortium on EDS and Related Disorders. And what that means is we have now a group of nearly 100 professionals that are made up of the committees and the um, working groups that published the 2017 criteria. And they are dedicated to pushing forward um, the research and the knowledge that we have about these syndromes and about the newly described hypermobility spectrum disorders. So we've never had that in place before. And I think everyone should feel very encouraged that there are people that are really now um, committing and dedicated to working together to, to make sure that this, this goes forward. So part of, well, the first thing that this consortium did um, was work for nearly two years on this new publication that came out in March 2017. And it was tireless work, working with people from all over the globe on conference calls. For some people, it's 4 o'clock in the morning and 10 o'clock at night. And, when you're trying to connect someone from Japan and, and the Netherlands and Israel. and it was, it was ambitious, but it was incredible. And we have a working group for each comorbidity. So everything, including POTS, is covered. And Lauren is the patient expert on the POTS group. So everyone is very well represented. And we had a committee for all of the types of EDS. So we had a rarer type, classical type, um, vascular type, and hypermobile type. So we really wanted to make sure we were covering everything. And going forward towards our next symposium, which is in Ghent in Belgium next uh, September, we are introducing a group on skin and a pediatric group because we learned from the process that there were gaps and that we needed to cover those. So we published this in the American Journal of Medical Genetics. It was nice that it was that journal because actually the last time that the nosology was published was 1997 in the same journal. And that's incredible to have a 20-year gap in, in something like this. I mean, this really is an area of medicine that needs to have a, lo a lot more respect, recognition, and validation. And we really hope that this publication will, will show people that, and they need to really sit up, listen, and learn. So this is what the publication looks like. It's made up of, as Claire said, 18 different papers. 96 medical professionals contributed to this publication. And as I said, and I will reiterate, we went to, waited 20 years for this. I think it's pretty unheard of that any comparable condition had such a big weight. And with that weight came a weight and a, and a pause in research and the funding that's needed to make that research happen. So it's no wonder that we are kind of starting in 2017 from the beginning, which is a little bit depressing and frustrating when you see experts like Claire and, and others that are here that have given years and years of work into this. And it's not been in vain because without that work, we wouldn't be here today. But we really are starting afresh. And I hope that we will continue to have successes and, and, and published material that can really prove while so many people in this room are suffering with POTS, 
that may also be suffering with EDS. Why is that? We need to know why. We went from six different types of EDS to 13. We know the uh, molecular cause for 12 of those types, and the only one we don't know the cause of is what most people in this room possibly think they have, which is the hypermobile form. And as I said, one of the most important things that happened was the hypermobility spectrum disorders were introduced. What we did all agree on is that right now, although we don't want to, we, we don't want to say it, but it's unfortunately all we can say with the evidence, is that we now still say that all the different forms, including hypermobile, are still rare. And the reason we don't want to say it is because many people have actually heard me say, this is not rare. This is the most you know, undi uh, misdiagnosed and underdiagnosed condition that we've ever seen before. And I still believe that. But the point is we can't prove that. So we need to say, OK, it's around 1 in 5,000 people. That's what we kind of think that we can see at the moment. And, and actually, with the new criteria, that's probably still going to remain the case. However, with this new hypermobility spectrum disorders, we could be talking about the kind of numbers Professor Graham have been talking about and others like him, one in a thousand, maybe even one in a hundred, one of the most underdiagnosed conditions. And the thing with the HSD, although it is a different criteria, it requires the same management and treatment, the same respect, the same understanding, the same validation. So what we're saying is that just because you no longer fulfill that criteria, it still means you need exactly the same care and management as if you did the hypermobile form of EDS. And part of this 18 papers was for the first time ever, we had published these management and care guidelines so that medical professionals can read about what happens when they have these patients that walk in and they're suffering from these symptoms. So what's our hope from this? Like I said, we want to prevent under and misdiagnosis in the medical world. We need to gain credibility and respect but what we also need to do, which is quite rare, is we need to prevent overdiagnosis in the patient world. We all know that doctor has got no waiting list. It's cheap and easy to see. Dr. Google, the worst doctor in the world. But unfortunately, for some of us, it's the only one that we can get an appointment with, right? So no one can be blamed for turning to that doctor. But unfortunately, it's caused a lot of damage. And there's people out there that say, I have EDS, when perhaps they actually don't. And that's fine, because they looking at the internet, you fulfill what, what is being described. So what we're trying to say is, you may not fulfill this criteria, but you have something. You have something that's very real and very physical that needs treatment and that needs understanding. We need to have better data for our registry that we're building. We need to have natural history studies and epidemiological studies so we can prove the prevalence of this. Are we horses or are we zebras or zebras, as you say? Um, so we need to know more, and we need to prove that prevalence. Just to give you an understanding of just in our small community how, how incredibly common the interest is in this, um, I, did a, I was very privileged to do a webinar with Dr. Claire Francomano at GBMC, which is where the Ehlers-Danlos Society um, Center is. And we launched the papers there with a press conference and this live webinar. And we had live 18 and a half thousand people watch us launching that criteria. And we reached over 110,000 people. I mean, to me, that's just phenomenal. And that, you know, that's capturing a very small audience of who knows us and who we know. There are so many people living with this all over the world that don't know they have it, you know, that think, you know, how can my stomach ache and my dislocated knee have anything to do with each other? You know, so there's a lot, lot we need to do. And the press conference as well attracted nearly 70,000 people watching on Facebook Live. So there's a lot of people out there that already know about us. So there's a lot of people that need to know about us. So what will us at the society, what will we do to spread this new classification and advance the knowledge and awareness of EDS? It's all well and good that we've got these papers. What are we going to do with them? So the th first thing we're begging, pleading with medical professionals to do, and we're also going to do the same for all of you. A lot of you have come up to me in that stand and said, I have EDS type 3. No, please don't use those terminologies. In fact, it wasn't in the 2017 criteria that these were, these were kind of ruled out. It was in the 1997 criteria that these were ruled out. That we don't use type 3, type 4, or we shouldn't use type 3, type 4. And I know there's a lot of professionals out there and specialists that are well known that still use it. And what we're trying to say is we need some consistency here. So if everybody, patients and doctors, could please use these new definitions. It's the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes. There's 13 of them. It's hypermobile EDS, not hypermobility. Very small differences, but it makes a difference if everybody is saying the same things. 
If you want to write it down, that's how to write it down. But most importantly, there is no such thing anymore as joint hypermobility syndrome or benign joint hypermobility syndrome. Unfortunately, the damage that had been done with that diagnosis was so bad that we had to get rid of it. Doctors were using it as a way to say, you don't have EDS here. If you want a diagnosis, have this. But no one was doing anything with it. Patients didn't want to be told they had that because they knew that they were, they were going to get nothing from it. So we were like, no one, please stop using that. We're now going to be using the hypermobility spectrum disorders. There's a lot more information in that. Um, it is a spectrum, so it, um, it will hopefully capture a lot more people. But most importantly, we don't want anyone to feel like they're losing out of anything. That, that if you don't fulfill the hypermobile criteria, that's it. Who am I? I've got no one to look after me. I've got no diagnosis. Well, you have, and it needs to be taken care of. And, and what else are we doing? Well, we're coming to to events like this, we're talking in public, we're trying to educate people as much as possible, we're trying to make the changes uh, um, kind of a systemic level at the WHO, at the nice, make, create some nice guidelines for those that don't know in the UK. Um, everything is done through nice guidelines, so we need an EDS guidelines. I spoke at rheumatology conference in 2017. In the UK, it's mainly rheumatologists that diagnose EDS. Over here, it's mainly geneticists. We need to change the ICD-10 codes. Now, when we first um, publish the criteria. We ambitiously thought this was something we were going to get on with straight away. Upon reflection, we realized that the likelihood is in, at Ghent in 2018, the criteria may be revised because what we've been asking professionals to do in this time between March that's just been and next September is we're going to be testing out the criteria in the way that should be done and saying, OK, well, if I have a patient in front of me, and I know through my clinical experience that they have EDS, but the criteria is not allowing me to diagnose it, why? And if we see that there is a consistent issue as to why that's happening, then we will update that. We will revise that. We now have the consortium, the people, and the structure in place to make these revisions every two years, and it will happen. We don't have to wait another 20 for that to change. So what we've thought is the responsible thing is to wait until after Ghent, see how the criteria has gone down. I'd like to say that with the professionals that have been using this, nearly 100 on the consortium, the feedback is very positive. And so far, everyone that they wanted to give a diagnosis to, they have been able to give a diagnosis to. So there haven't been enough consistent problems with it that we're worried about at the moment, but we're giving it time and we're doing it globally. And if we need to revise it, we will. Many of you have heard me talk about a registry. We desperately need an international registry. And not only do we want to do this to collate information on the mutations that we know, so bringing together labs with uh, gene testing of the, the rarer types that we know of, we also want to use it as discovery. So we want to do whole genome sequencing and create almost an EDS panel and do whole e exome sequencing. Um, we're also going to do a patient-led social science study, so that's finding out kind of phenotypic details about what people are living with, what age they got diagnosed. Are there more women living this, with this than men? Are there more people in America living with it than in Germany? You know, we need to know these answers, and a registry is the way to answer these. But a registry is very complex. The data is only as good as what you put in. So we are really taking our time to consider it carefully. We have a team of experts working on it. We have outsiders advising us on it. And I would just remind people to be patient. We don't want to do this wrong. We've waited this long for it. But it is on its way, and there are excellent people working on making it possible. I'd also like to invite every single one of you here to our learning conference in Vegas between the 7th and the 9th of September. It's going to be an amazing lineup of speakers, really fantastic. All the comorbidities are covered. Um, we've got great social activities. We're holding a zebra ball or a zebra ball. Either or. Um, and we'd love to see you there. So registration is still open. You can find out the details on our website. And uh, come and say hey if you met me here. And the final thing that I'd like to leave all of you with, if there's any medical professionals in the room still listening, dissemination. You've heard the saying, you can take a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. I'm pretty sure it's the same for zebras. We can publish these papers. We can do all this work. We can have a website. We can have a consortium. We can have symposiums. But if we can't get this information out effectively and make people listen, it's, it's all for nothing. 
We need everybody in this room's help. We need everyone out there that's on social media listening into this, or um, doctors that are listening to this. Tell your colleagues. Point them in the right direction of these papers. Ask your doctors to read it. People constantly say, but my doctor won't listen, but my doctor won't listen. Find one that will. Educate, and most importantly, re-educate your doctors. The ones that think they know. The EDS is, just means you're a bit bendy with stretchy skin. No, it doesn't. It's a multi-systemic condition that can ruin people's lives. And what we're seeing more and more is patients are getting much sicker than they need to. People are ending up in wheelchairs and bedbound when they don't need to. People are having more anxiety and depression. We're seeing suicides rates go up. This is all preventable. If people are diagnosed early and managed and treated effectively, we can really change people's lives. So I ask all of you to take responsibility to tell people about this condition, point them to our website, and tell people that we can look forward to a more positive future. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? So for those that didn't hear, the question was, are they going to be reassessing the Baton score, uh, which is um, the test that we do to measure hypermobility? And the answer is yes. I think our, our expectations when we started this out was we kind of naively said to the group, can you please revise it so that shoulders and knees, at the very least, are considered? Hips. And, and hips. <laughs> um, and sorry, yes, sh uh, shoulders and hips. And the thing is, is the reason they couldn't is because we don't know how to measure them. And that's what needs, so that's, they, they know that. And we have a working group dedicated to just the Baton score who are working between now and Ghent to try and see how they can improve it, what, what ways can there be that they can measure it. It's all very well and good in saying, please include the hips and shoulders. What, how does a doctor measure hypermobility in a shoulder? You know, it's, it's already inconsistent. So it is a very good tool to measure hypermobility, and it works, but it does need to be perfected, and it is being worked on. What would move a doctor from, what's the difference basically? Okay, so the, the difference between the classical type and the hypermobile type, and my, the way I think of it kind of simplistically is the degree of involvement of the skin. So it, for somebody who has that really super stretchy skin that can just go out to here or tie in a knot over their head, that kind of thing, um, and the, that extreme skin fragility where people, as they're starting to learn to walk, the toddlers, they bump into a coffee table and, you know, they just, their skin splits open and it creates those very typical scars in the shins. That's what makes me think about testing for the classical type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. In the, in the hypermobile type, the skin is involved, it's soft, it's a little bit stretchy, but it's not this super stretchy, and it's not nearly as fragile as it is in the classical type. So the skin involvement is, um, there, the stretchy skin and the unusually soft skin are two of the long list of generalized systemic disorders involving the connective tissue. So those can be negative if there are five others that are positive elsewhere on the list. It's an easy answer. So the, the lady's asking, well, when does HSD become hypermobile EDS um, if you have all the same comorbidities? And something I'd like everyone to take home with today is that it, hypermobile EDS doesn't mean you're iller than someone with hypermobility spectrum disorder. You can have someone that's on TPN in a wheelchair with every single comorbidity with HSD that does not fulfill the criteria for hypermobile EDS. And you can have someone with hypermobile EDS that works nine to five every week, that's functioning well, that doesn't really appear to be very ill, that fulfills the criteria for hypermobile EDS. Don't think of it as, a, as an iller or a, a more severe. It's not that. It's looking through it through a different lens of criteria. So the reason that it doesn't matter about the comorbidities is because actually, to some controversially, the comorbidities are not part of the diagnostic criteria. And the reason that is is because there's not enough evidence at the moment to pr prove the causation and the relationship between them. We know it's there anecdotally and clinically. We can't prove why. And what we need to do now is fund a lot of research to prove it. Now, the closest areas that we're in to, to it approaching to get to the criteria is in POTS. 
and dysautonomia and the GI issues. They're two areas where there is research going on and I think that we're close to saying this is part of EDS and this is why. But as of this publication, the whole work leading up to it was a review of what we know, what, what we need to know and how we're going to find it out. And so the process we're going through now is how we need to find it out. We know what we need to know. Every single one of those groups needs to prove how it's associated to EDS. So the line is drawn not because of the amount of comorbidities you have or how hypermobile you are. It's whether or not you fulfill the criteria. And, it, and I think people need to not panic if they don't because it's not, oh God, I'm not, I'm not in the club, I'm not as ill, I won't get my benefits, I won't be covered in insurance. We know they're very real fears and that they, are, they may be the case for some people. All we can do is say we've done this because it needed to change. Because even with a hypermobile uh, diagnosis, people weren't getting those things. So what we want to ensure is that people do get those things with both diagnoses. And it's going to take time. I promise you it will take years. Well, in, a, in a sense, it is a new phrase for joint hypermobility syndrome. But the thing is, is joint hypermobility syndrome previously and hypermobile EDS had the same diagnostic criteria. And there was a paper published where Brad Tinkle and Rodney Graham said they were one in the same things. But what we're saying now is, although in a sense it is, it's not because it's in a totally new um, diagnostic. It, it's more the thing to think about, and this is another thing we are working on leading up to Ghent, is it's more of an exclusion criteria. So there's not, in a sense, a, a diagnostic criteria for HSD. It's where you do not fulfill the criteria for hypermobile EDS that you then get the diagnosis of one of the HSDs. So it's not like two checklists and which one do you fulfill. It's you start with hypermobile EDS, and if you do not fulfill it, it leads you to HSD. And that, that journey to HSD shouldn't be a negative one, and it shouldn't be seen as one for both doctors and patients. And it's our job, and what we're committing to everyone to do, is that we're going to do our utmost to make sure that doctors do respect, validate, and treat both diagnoses equally. So the question is, isn't, uh, aren't the hypermobility spectrum disorders uh, just variable expressivity, as I was saying before, of the, of the um, hypermobile type of EDS? And until we have a molecular a set of molecular causes for hypermobile EDS, we're really not going to be able to answer that question. But I hope with all my heart that in the next couple of years we'll, we'll be able to answer it really definitively. But right now we're working off of clinical criteria and there are some families where some people are going to look like they have hypermobile EDS and then others are meeting diagnostic criteria more for the hypermobility spectrum disorder. No, no, no. If you meet the diagnostic criteria for hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, you, you still have the di If you meet these new criteria, we and would, that, yeah, and, and then it would just, I would recommend that your mom be looked at sort of with this new lens, you know, and the fact that you do meet diagnostic criteria in mind, because sometimes that can kind of bump people over into the diagnosis if there's an affected family member. Sure. And I think, what, I think what is important as well is we're not going to find one gene for, in this group. There's, I, in five years, we may be having different names for five or six different groups. I think we're running out of time, is that right? Yeah. So maybe one more question at the back there, that gentleman. Did you hear that? So you, EDS is described as a collagen condition, if I, if I got this right. Um, are there other collagen conditions that present similarly to EDS? That should so be considered. There, there's a very wide range. There's a sort of umbrella that we call the hereditary disorders of connective tissue. And many of them present with joint hypermobility. So that was really the reason for that third criteria in the diagnostic uh, criteria to make sure that we're excluding any other possible diagnoses. Like for type 1 collagen, there's a form of um, connective tissue called brittle bone disease that presents with a lot of fractures. And there's an overlap syndrome between EDS and, and osteogenesis imperfecta or brittle bone disease. So that's why it's important to see a geneticist for somebody to really think about what other possible diagnoses might explain the, the conditions that people are experiencing. I'm really sorry we have to stop, but uh, thank you very, very much for we'll your be attention. We'll at the table outside if anyone has any questions.